Thank you. And um, thank you so much for this. Um, I, all right, if you can see this, this is great. Now, uh, this is one thing here. Uh, I speak only for myself and I'm on annual leave. Now, this may sound like a very awkward thing I am saying, but I do need to tell you that I do not represent the United States government uh, on this at all. Uh, anything, if it has any value, it's mine. All the typos I'm sure you will see are mine too. Okay, and I'm sure I will, after 25 minutes, somebody will say, Mark, wrap it up. We're gonna talk <laughs> a little about something and I'm excited about this because we've had such excellent presentations so far about the right and anti-Semitism, the right and efforts to delegitimize Israel. And that's fine, we certainly have that issue. But I'm going to submit to you today that there's also perhaps an issue with the left. And it's a very interesting approach when you talk about an alliance of black leaders, intellectuals, more than a few, or people of color, if you'd like, gays, lesbians, trans, whom you think would have the most incentive to uh, at least support a state of Israel, but instead a campaign to have it eliminated. We talk about the origins of the term of left Goshism. And when we talk about the green and the red, the red would be for the left. The green is the color of Islam. You know, you could combine also green, red, pink for gays, whatever color you have for women, pink again. And, and others, you could really have a rainbow of colors to talk about this very loose alliance. I am not suggesting when I talk about an alliance or an access that anybody gets a membership card. I'm talking about overlapping ideas that form to find a common agenda, often a loose agenda, but a common prism through which to see Israel, the Middle East and Jews. Um, the, the term bobos or bourgeois bohemians refer to some of the people who at 1990s began to reach out to many of the new Muslims. And this huge wave of immigration of immigrants came. Um, some on the left saw this new cohort as a way to stave off the left in France and in Britain and elsewhere. They could say, this is a new cohort and we can partner with them to have a kind of a common front against what they would call the, uh, the right wing. Now, in response to this too, there was a feeling, and Dr. Herf talked about a replacement theory. There was a concern too in Europe, and you have a, a book that I would recommend to you, it's called Submission or Submission. And uh, Michel Ulbeck talks about a dystopic alliance of Muslims and those who support them in a, a France that would be in the not too distant future. Um, but really this is a neologism that is a tacit alliance of public intellectuals, politicians, Muslims. I think Dr. Herf referred to, to Berman. He talked a little bit about this too in the flight of the intellectuals. Well, most of us think traditionally about leftism as class warfare or as kind of an inevitable progress of mankind dialectically taking Hegel, putting him on his head and talking about a class struggle moving to a state of communism. And you may still have that too, but I put it to you that what concerns a lot of people today what concerns me is using some of the themes of Marxism that is a constant dialectic of oppressive forces that is constant struggle and not having the element so much on wealth. In fact, I think many on the left like the Mark Booker, or Zuckerbergs or Dorsey and they don't talk about them in the context that others spoke about the railroads and the octopus. No, they talk a lot about identity politics. They talk a lot about race. They talk a lot about tribalism. 
And it concerns me, and I think it should concern many Jews, when people talk about tribalism in this country. Now you have a lexicon that you developed in the 80s and 90s, and many of you who uh, teach courses in literature or in sociology are very conversant in this. A kind of postmodern talk, it's a jargon. And much of this is very inaccessible to people who don't speak this language. I'm reminded a little bit of Scientology who invented a new language to bring people in, to keep people out and to identify the other. Well, leftism by at its very roots, and if anybody would like to dispute this, I would like to hear it, is very anti-Semitic. One need only listen to uh, or to read the uh, Karl Marx's on the Jewish question. And it wasn't just that alone. Marx referred to Jews as large-nosed parasites, as hucksters. Um, and so when you talk about the origins of anti-Semitism, uh, left-wing anti-Semitism, I'd give it to Karl Marx. Mm -hmm. Now, criticism of Jews or, is, or of Israel is not necessarily anti-Semitic. I'm not saying that it is. Israel is a robust democracy, the only one out there. But for the purposes of this presentation, when you have the three Ds, the delegitimization of Israel, the demonization of Israel, and double standards towards Israel, my argument is that you do move into the era of realm of anti-Semitism. In the 1960s, let's go back a little bit, and all of you know some of this, and some of you know much more about the Frankfurt School than I do. Some of you may be adherents of this, and so the name Adorno and Marcuse are taught regularly in your classes. I think Jeffrey Hirsch mentioned the, ter uh, the, the term March to the Institutions. Well, this, if, this is credited to Rudy Dutschke. Um, if he didn't coin it, he popularized it. And it really comes back to his view and Antonio Gramsci and others who saw that this great revolution is not going to come. You're not going to have a proletarian uprising, okay? Their critical school out of the University of Frankfurt then refocused the effort. And much of this then would go to institutions. You're going to work within institutions, institutions of power. He was a strategist, other Saul Alinsky, I would argue, was a tactician. I don't think you could argue that it has not been effective in universities. I'd love to hear you if you want a question and answer. But what you have by the 1980s, 1990s, is the university now becoming an engine of different types of leftism. At the same time, money came in from the Middle East. You had OPEC and you had a lot of money and new prestige, pride and power among Arabs and Arab states. And Saudi Arabia and Qatar and Oman and others began to build centers of Mideast Studies Association. Now, at once you would say, what on earth would a leftist have to do with Saudi money teaching the Middle East? We'll get into that. Here you see critical race theory. Here, uh, Herbert Marcuse. Now, this comes from a movie and the movie is Hail Caesar. And Herbert Marcuse here is talking to um, screenwriters about dialectics and in the background you see Malibu and it's supposed to be a funny scene an avuncular character here um, the kind of guy you almost want to hug well I don't think that Herbert Marcuse was very huggable he had a very distinct view of using the universities repressing tolerance but he also made a comment, too, that would be taken up. This would be, social classes are fluid. People on the bottom want to become rich. They want to make better lives. Some see communism as the way to do it. But 
race itself is less transient, is more static. And therefore you have, and he agreed with that and you saw an explosion of study departments, of a kind of tribalism in the academy. You had studies courses. Okay, what is the common theme? The common theme is an anchoring theme in Marxism and that is power dynamics, power struggle, a meta narrative. And so you now move, we talked a little bit about red now, that's all the time we have. Let's talk about the blacks in this access. Martin Luther King, of course, was a very great man and very influential, but he was not, he was not the only man who was influential. Other men who were very influential too was, was um, Malcolm X. Malcolm X is, every, we have a park named after him. He is being taught as part of the, Dina? Dina? Yes. Sorry. All right. Um, so uh, Malcolm X is absolutely iconic. And if you have kids who are in middle school, if you have kids in high school, I can promise you, if you have kids who are in universities, he is cast as one of the great leaders, one of the iconic figures and foundational figures of the black movement um, in this country too. The problem here is, he was deeply anti-Semitic. Um, he talked to Jews really in the same way Marx did, as hucksterism, as exploiters. How does this fit into the green, red, black access? Well, he became a Muslim. He went on the Hajj. And if he toned down his anti-Semitism, it still came out. Uh, Louis Farrakhan is a very flamboyant anti-Semite, but he is not, I would say to you, marginal. He is very much part of the Black Lives Movement um, of marches on Washington. Uh, he's been referred to by fellow Blacks as a goat or the greatest of all time. Other Blacks are very, very anti-Semitic. Cynthia McKinney, uh, McKinney dropped out of the national scene. That's true, but she was a a several term congresswoman from Georgia. She appears regularly, well, sometimes on press TV. I'd like you to remember this if you could too. Press TV is the Iranian television station that hosts together some of the conferences. Now you've all heard of the conference um, about the uh, cartoon characters and that competing for the most anti-Semitic cartoon character possible. Um, this is part of that. And you have a number of Blacks and feminists, as we will see, who go to Iran and enjoy Iran and uh, are fitted with awards by the mullahs of Iran. Uh, BLM toned down maybe some of its anti-Semitism, but it supports BDS. Al Sharpton comes in and out of popularity with the Democratic Party. It was he who talked to Jews as diamond merchants, and we can go on and on and on. One of the most unconventional partners in this access would be Islamo, would, would be the kind of Islamo feminism. Now, Linda Sarsour is among the more, more famous, and she does have credibility in the Democratic Party. She was openly an advisor to Bernie Sanders. And I think that her importance will only grow in this administration, as you could imagine, with the squad. If you disagree with that, I'd love to hear from you. She said, I was just a white Brooklyn girl who put on a hijab and became a militant woman of color. Is that what happens? We've had people talk about people of color. I don't know a little bit about you, but I don't know exactly what a person of color is. If somebody puts a piece of a tefillin on and says, I am a Jewish man of color, can you be? I don't know. What are the rules? Does it have implications for Jews? You better believe it does. Because there's this vast undefined term that is based in many ways on the ideas of oppression. Who are the people who are oppressed? The people of color. 
Who are the people who oppress them? The white people. And who are the whitest of the white? We are. You say, what's with Cosmo Girl and Teen Vogue? This is very clever because popular culture comes downstream from the universities. Those people who study journalism and sociology and literature today, the next generation goes into journalism. And you have what struck me as interesting in a Cosmo Girl. If you have daughters, you'll know Cosmo Girl. Or if you just go to a dentist's office, you'll have a Teen Vogue. And they'll talk about the empowering uh, facility of a hijab. And they have all sorts of uh, makeup and this. Well, in a magazine, Cosmo Girl, where they have articles on how to be cute for summer boys, what do you have with class struggle or, or oppression? Because these are written by, um, by women who introduce social justice into these magazines. And these are just a few. So these are the kind, if somebody wants to wear a hijab, I'm not slamming hijabs. The argument that I make, and I hope you will share, is what if you don't want to wear a hijab? And here, a book that just came yesterday by an Iranian I follow around, The Wind in My Hair, She Didn't Want to, Ayan Hirsi Ali. And by the way, Linda Sarsour, who is so popular, uh, was on tape saying, uh, Linda, that Ayan Hirsi Ali is not a real woman. She's an Islamophobe. And if I could, I'd cut her vagina out. Uh, this uh, Ayan Hirsi Ali, by the way, Brandeis decided I could go on and on and bore you to tears with anecdotes, but we're running out of time. Here's something. Medea Benjamin, anybody ever hear of, of Code Pink? Are they part of the Alliance? Well, if the Alliance does exist, and I suggest it does, they're certainly at the heart of it. They talk a lot about social justice, once again, not clearly defined. They loathe America, they loathe Israel, and they don't want either to exist. Medea Benjamin is quite a piece of work, a relic from the 1960s. She was Susan Benjamin from Long Island who went to Tufts in Columbia. She then changed her name to Medea. Uh, Medea was the wife of Jason. Medea killed her two children because her wife loved mm -hmm. her children his children more than anything else in the world. I bring this up because I think sometimes it helps to get into the mind, the impenetrable mind of some of these people. Uh, Ariel Gold too is a provocateur and it makes it very, very difficult because some of the same women who claim to be feminists when they go to Iran cover their hair in scarves. And a lot of women don't. I don't know if any of you remember Ariana Falace. If you don't, mm -hmm. I, I hope you should. Well, she was one of the first women to get an interview with Ayatollah Khomeini. And they said, if you want to talk to him, you have to put on this uh, on, on, to be modest. And she took the scarf and threw it on the ground. And she said, I'm a today's woman, and I'm not going to wear this medieval rag. There's a real woman for you. I wonder if they even mention her name in universities. Maybe one of you can tell me. Now we have Judith Butler. You better believe she's part of this access too. <laughs> Judith, I'm glad somebody's laughing. <laughs> Judith Butler gets awards regularly for the worst writing imaginable, turgid prose. Now I know some of you are deconstructionists and this and that, so I don't want to spend too much time into this too. But it makes it very difficult for us to understand what people are writing. They had jokes. What do you get <clears throat> when you mix a deconstructionist with a mafioso? A proposition you can't understand. All right, so I'm not ready for the borscht belt, but it gives you the kind of idea of how hard it is for people outside of these groups to even understand what they're saying. Well, there's clarion crystal clarity when it comes to her hatred of Israel. <clears throat> She is, is, is as important in third wave feminism as Edward Said was in post-colonial theory. She is feted with awards. She gets the Theodora Adorno Award at the University of Frankfurt, as you could imagine. And when she attacks Israel, people listen to her. 
the fact that she was at least born Jewish gives her more credible. It makes her very valuable, quite a prize. Also, when other Jews begin to defend Israel or to suggest that Israel be allowed to exist in the comedy of nations, people can then say, it's not anti-Semitic. Just look at Judith Butler, she's a Jew, and we're going to get to this too. Here's a dyke march. I'll see two people, a woman holding burning flags of Israel and the United States. This was in Chicago. Zionism is queer phobic. I don't know how you grapple with or, or even discuss that. The fact that Israel is alone among countries where two men and two women can be come out of the closet to go to their nightclubs and not have to worry about beating is irrelevant. In fact, what is it called? It is called pinkwashing. Perhaps you've heard that portmanteau of um, well, not whitewash, and they think this is very clever too. You're dealing too, when they talk about pinkwashing, a cohort of 19 or 18 to 22 year olds where this kind of word is bad and they bring it on and they bring it into their lexicon. There is some pushback, God bless these people, they are Jewish gays who are saying, well, wait a minute, we want to, if there's going in this movement too, we should have some kind of place. Israel is not all bad and I'm going to wave the Jewish gay flag and I wish these people all the luck in the world. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, this, it's interesting here, Phyllis Chesler, who was very important in second wave feminism Basically, that was the feminism from the 70s through the 90s, um, became very alienated and Stal she, she, called, she says that the gay liberation is now Stalinized and so is the women's movement. Uh, the World Council of Churches too. Do you know who today is the new Palestinian? Jesus Christ, who died on the cross at the hands of the Jews. Any similarities going back, I think, Dr. Herf talked about the original anti-Semitism, the Christ of the crime of deicide, and we have this inserted kind of sideways into it. The supersession or replacement theory that Jews were stripped of God's favor because of the oppression of the Palestinians. Anybody remember Matthew about the blood of the people will be upon them? Take a look at this. The blood of the people of Palestine will be upon them too. The relig and you is the uh, World Council of Churches leftist. You bet came right out of the Soviet Union. Maybe that's something that we should discuss. Here are some others. Joel Koval, <laughs> the Al social study at Bard College. You know, it's interesting. We're changing names of, of universities, the whole departments. Woodrow Wilson is gone, um, but you, you still have Alger Hiss here. Um, so we can giggle at somebody who's a marginal character. He is gone. There was a dust up there and they got rid of him. There's nothing to laugh about when it comes to Chomsky. Chomsky is absolutely iconic. There is a religion about him. I would compare him to L. Ron Hubbard and his acolytes of Scientology. They're, he's aggressive, he's angry, and using the critical theory method, using the Alinsky method, he turns everything around. He's also deeply narcissistic and he loves to talk. Um, and he has tremendous prestige too. Norman Finkelstein, you, everybody knows about Norman Finken, Finkelstein. Uh, he didn't get tenure at DePaul University. If anything, that boosted his image. He's a pamphleteer. Um, but he's also very popular. He's sorted. He, he's uh, cited quite a bit. Uh, I think Chomsky is cited after Marx more than anybody else out there. I don't have the exact numbers on that. Uh, J Street, is it anti-Israel? I believe absolutely that it is too. Once again, it gives good cover. So they will not come out and advocate BDS, but they will partner with Jewish Voice for Peace, with other organizations who will. They're far too clever for that. We didn't talk that much about the, the green. We just don't have time in that. Islam is this. On campuses, check out the Muslim Students Association. Yeah, 
there are two of them. There's one for the Sunni and there's one uh, for the Shia. Did you know that they were that the Sunni was an offshoot of the Islamic Brotherhood in the 1960s? Uh, I'm not saying today that all of them are brothers, and I've written chapters on books about that. But I'm saying that the ideology is pretty, pretty much, uh, pretty much the same. So it should be Southern Poverty Law Center. Yet one of my many typos here. Um, they are not, in, in my view, uh, they unfairly target critics of of uh, not of only of Islam, certainly, but of Sharia. So what are these points of intersection? Because I talked about an access and alliance. The West is a source of oppression, as you could see. Jews are very white. And there's something very important to being indigenous. Now, indigenous is one of these things like as people of color that are not clearly defined. And when you press people on it, they'll become very, very defensive. Um, and if you say that I don't understand this, you would kind of have the Robin DeAngelo. The fact that you even have to ask this questions proves that you are in, that you are, are a racist and you are hostile to indigenous people. Well, I thought Jews were indigenous to to Israel. Nope. Um, much of the comments too are uncontested. So where you have um, and I disagree, by the way, with Jeffrey Herf on this, this whole thing with this, a bunch of yahoos. I, I don't think it was a, a, a threat to democracy, but I'm only speaking for myself. Um, but, but let's move on. What are the challenges? Daniel Pipes, I believe one of the great, great minds of, of this generation or any other on the Middle East, he coined the term the Rushdie Rules. That is, after Solomon Rushdie made a, wrote a book and a fatwa was put on his head, the West had been very, very quiet about criticizing any elements of Islam or making fun of the prophet. Samuel Patti, a very brave uh, uh, high school teacher, was cut up, and I can go on and on about Charlie Hebdo. Let's see how many. Uh, let's see how many professors will put those cartoons on their, um, in their courses. I would say very, very few. Um, but the rules are now, whatever you think about is about Islam, shut up about it. And it's very effective. Um, we can see now with critical theory, some people say it doesn't really exist or the NEA does this. We can have a talk about that too. Critical theory and how it affects the Jews. I'd love to debate somebody on that. You have the shifting demographics. Well, replacement theory. Is it necessarily a stupid, bigoted, Bush, Trump idea to say a replacement theory? Who's replacing what? Are we being replaced by a sense, from a, a sense of, of nationhood to a sense of tribalism? I think that this is a very reasonable thing to discuss, and I would love to debate anybody on this. And Jewish voices, by and large, are very quiet. I think if you go on campuses, yeah, I think Hillel will be quiet. They don't want to cause trouble. And I don't think professors uh, cause trouble. And I think that you learn very early on your way to tenure. I'm not criticizing any of you individually, but that the nail that stacks up got, gets knocked down. Conclusions, that it does exist that there's declining defense of free speech in the country, in the social media. What was it? I think that Huey Long said fascism will come to this country, but it will be disguised as anti-fascism. Uh, and I would say that the universities are the engines for many elements of anti-Semitism. So there I am. The only rule for me is if I am particularly interested in those people who think that I'm full of it, and if, if uh, I'd love to hear from you, I'd love to hear your criticism. I said it before, I'll say it again, these comments are mine and mine alone. I've gotten into a lot of trouble with this. If you have an argument, I do not speak for the government, I speak for myself. Thank you.